This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. All right, we've got some sponsors for the pod now. Wait, what? Every link you need for the things we talk about here is at artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors. First up, books. If you're into this podcast... Odds are you're probably a reader. We've got links to buy new books from bookshop.org and used books from alibris.com. And if you want to listen to your books, we recommend and use audible.com. It's great and the catalog is huge. All right. So if you're listening to this, you are online. Maybe you're very online. You probably have a website or are thinking of starting one. Maybe you want a website like artofdarkpod.com. We built that with WordPress, which is by far the most popular way to create websites. And the single best host for serious WordPress is WP Engine. I've personally used them for over a decade now, and I don't host my websites anywhere else. Go to artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors and click on the WP Engine link to learn more. Finally, the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Get the bonus After Dark content for every episode, access to the book club, and more. Thanks for supporting Art of Darkness. And I, I don't think that was too painful. I think no, we did a pretty good job good. there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it. Okay, we are back in the dark room. I am Brad Kelly. Brad Kelly on Twitter. This is my co-host, Kevin Kautzman. Kevin, how are you doing? Never better, Brad. Excellent. I'm ready. This All week. Right. This week. Sunday is the first day of the week. It is the Lord's Day. Mm. And this is the week that I travel to <laughs> the top of the mitt That's true. of Michigan to yeah. have a very serious week, more or less a week-long production meeting with Brad. Mm -hmm. This is the week that we write off our uh, steaks, our cigars, yeah. Yeah. our coffee. Yeah. Everything gets written off this yeah. week. I cannot wait. Uh, I'm going to go see Brad in Michigan. It's going to yeah, be a lot of fun. We're going, yeah. to, going to have, we are going to plan season four. Yeah. And I think yep, we've absolutely. got some goodies for people. We might do a Twitter spaces this week. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. We we're probably going to record our, our plotting for Patreon. Right. Yeah. So if you want to kind of, you know, uh, see how the sausage is made, if you want to yeah. join the sausage party uh, <laughs> that Brad and I are going to have in the woods, uh, you're going to want to sign up at patreon.com slash art of dark pot. And let me say, we're having one of our better months on Patreon. Mm -hmm. If we can do what we've done this month, plus maybe another 50 percent, maybe another we can do this consistently. This crazy experiment in podcasting is going to be sustainable very yeah. happy to see that how are yeah, you and if, if you yeah i'm great and if you've just joined the patreon or you've been with us for a while thank you so much it really does mean the world for us to us we're doing yes. this for you i'm good i'm ready to have you uh kevin up north at the undisclosed location you know we're gonna burn some wood we're gonna mm. talk some books we're, we're gonna, gonna have burn a, some book wood time. we're gonna burn some bridges <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> yeah yeah you never know no, a few days no, we're gonna woods. be you never yeah, know how it's yeah. going to end up. I'm, but... I'm domesticated. Why don't you introduce our guest for this dark <laughs> yes, room episode? Yes, we're going to talk course. about Bolaño. We're going to talk about Borges. Let's go. Yeah, we are joined by the author Dustin Cole. Dustin Cole is the author of a, a book that is coming out on September 4th. Uh, is that correct, Dustin? September yeah, 4th at shipping. Um, Run the Bead from Soyo's Books. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, sent a review copy. I, I haven't I haven't finished it yet, but I will tell you, it is compelling. I am bringing it up north with me and we'll be likely finishing it up there. Um, really good stuff. Uh, um, I want to let Dustin, I was going to kind of gab about it, but Dustin, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a story set in late 2020. Uh, and it starts out in the lower mainland in 
North Vancouver, which is a part of Vancouver, the greater Vancouver area. Mm-hmm. And it features a few male characters. Um, the first, the main, the, the, I would say like the main pro tag is a guy named Ward Brown, who, who's a shipyard welder. So he b- builds big ships and stuff like that. The, <clears throat> and, can I yeah. say the, the welding part of it feels very true to life. I, I don't weld, so I don't know, but it feels yeah. super authentic. So you That's nailed good. it there, I think. At least from a reader who doesn't know anything about welding. It seems like I'm ta- I, I, it seems like I'm in the hands of somebody who really knows what they're talking about. Well, that's the that's like the the hope, you know, uh, mm-hmm. to, you know, is in naturalistic fiction, um, mm-hmm. which is it's a work of naturalistic contemporary fiction with, um, you know, forays into different genres and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, my brother's a welder, so he okay. helped me. He, he doesn't build ships. He doesn't do that kind of work, but he helped with some of that. Um and then, you know, the other main characters are uh, an RCMP officer uh, with, a, with a disabled son um, who's he, and also a wife who's a successful science fiction author. Um, so he's a <laughs> cop and, and, you know, it, it goes through, you know, his beat and, and some of his um, more, well, probably evenly distributed um half and half with his beat, his cop work, and then his family life. So mm-hmm. there's a kind of like, uh, like a sort of, but like a bifurcation in his yeah. life. Um, and then the third character who is probably, I would say the most dynamic main character in the book, his name's Govinda Bendy or Betty. Mm-hmm. And he's like a, he's a former commando who, who served in Afghanistan Mm -hmm. and he's now a longshoreman and he, but he kind of takes on intimidation jobs for the labor union for different labor unions. So he, he's kind of like this, um, a quite unpredictable fellow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just basically about how these, so the, these three characters lives become, intertwined unbeknownst to them um known a bit but like not really Mm -hmm. they don't personally know to what extent their lives have been intertwined right right interesting there's like some dramatic irony i i can feel it going that way so far you know you kind of got some balls rolling and i can feel them be, I can feel how they're going to collide. As I said, I'm, I'm not yeah. all the way through them, so I don't know what's going to happen yet. But I'm, I'm very eagerly anticipating it. Um, and the you are hitting the these different genres. Run name the name of the novel. Run the bead. Yeah, and you're yeah. looking at it. Fourth. Yeah, Run you can pre-order it, pre-order it right now. And so go books. on, Brad. There's, you were saying. there's been excerpts, and also if you want to check it out, there's been excerpts. Uh, Dustin, tell us about where the excerpts have been published and how people can find. There's those. a couple. Yeah, there's a couple excerpts in apocalypse confidential and then there's another excerpt in expat great and those are and there might be i'm not so i'm not sure i should know this but i don't there might be actually an excerpt on the soyos website too okay but i i'm i'm unaware of that i know that thomas at soyos books was doing was thinking about doing that but i'm not sure i can't okay. I, I couldn't say for sure, but yeah, those are three for sure that are out there. Like if you yeah. want to kind of get a, ta- get a taste for the writing, the yeah. style and stuff. Yeah, and that's where, I, that's where I came across your work was in The Great Apocalypse Confidential. We love those guys over there and what, what, what everything they're doing. So very yeah. cool to see uh, worlds coming together here. Um, yeah. Now, oh, um, when you and I got talking, sort of trying to figure out how can we have a conversation that sort of fits the format of our show, and I sort of threw a few subjects at you, and you kind of jumped at Borges and Bolaño, and and I'm I'm liking this idea more and more as we go, Kevin, doing these dark rooms where we kind of bring two two subjects together and see what well, kind of sparks can Well, those two are so fly. obvious. Those two They're, are a clear. You, one. you really yeah. shouldn't talk about Bolaño without talking about Borges. Yeah, so right, right. Here we so, are. Yeah, so I just wanted... Unfortunately, we couldn't get Aaron Gwynn, 
the <laughs> renowned Borges <laughs> scholar. We're, yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. Of course, Aaron will be back for the, and he's, we're getting requests for yeah. Aaron to come back on the pod. Yeah. He will be back for the, the blood Meridian book club special for Patreon right. in December. So if you have, if you can't get enough Gwyn, if you, <laughs> you're going to want to join just for that. Somebody on Twitter said we should do like a, like a sleepaway camp <laughs> or Gwyn should do it. Uh, maybe I hijacked, but he's like, if somebody said I would pay good money to go to West Texas <laughs> to sit around a camp, like a campfire and hear Aaron Gwyn read blood Meridian. And I got yeah. to thinking about that. That yeah. might be where we, we cross over because of the whole, the long, the long con here for art of darkness is of course, to start a cult. Uh, <laughs> well, in any case, uh, this is a little Still tangential. The beads. <laughs> um, Dustin, I, yeah, right. Um, Dustin, I get the impression that you are, are you, are you from uh, Canada? Are you, yeah. are you Canadian? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Born and raised. You... I'm from uh, Alberta. I'm in Alberta right now. Hmm. Okay. Um, but I lived for many years in Vancouver. Okay. Uh, yeah. For about Great. 15 or 16 years until fairly recently. Okay. All right. Great. Well, let's let's get into it then. Yeah. Uh, Borges Bolaño, what what is it about these two authors? And then I'll I'll give the track back to to Brad here. But yeah, tell yeah. us, Dustin, what what about these two uh, moves you? Um, it's a good question. Difficult to summarize, but I think what comes to mind, what you know, off the top of my dome, I would have to mm-hmm. say that both authors seem to be able to take almost anything, you know, and create compelling fiction out of it Um, or poetry or nonfiction, like criticism. Um, With Borges, he's just someone with um, really almost like a superhuman erudition, Mm -hmm. deep and broad almost limitless, you know, in his interest, which is like world literature. And, you know, I say, I'd say probably philosophy and linguistics. And what he does with that is amazing. You know, like you, you don't really, you don't really see that many um, deeply erudite people being so creative with their material. And the same, Mm -hmm. same goes for, for Bolaño, you know, I was reading, rereading some stuff. I read this story in The Return, in that collection, The Return. And it's one near the end, and it's just called Photographs, I think. And it's just about Arturo Bolaño, his his alter ego, his literary alter ego, which, you know, also connects with Borges, because Borges is also writing from his own literary alter ego. But this story is maybe one of Bolaño's lesser known, lesser celebrated. And it's basically just his alter ego stranded in a village in North Africa, looking at a, an anthology of French poets from all over the world. So like different types of people with different ancestry who write poetry in French and, and his alter ego is just kind of going through, going through the photos of these, French language, these francophone poets. And what he does with it is uh, uncanny. Yeah. And, and uh, that, you know, goes like, to your, that goes really well to your point because you described that. And frankly, without knowing the author, that doesn't sound super interesting to me. But you mm-hmm. tell me that Bolaño wrote it. I'm like, oh, I wonder what he got up to. Like, it suddenly I am interested in this project. Whereas if you told yeah. me it was, you know, some other writer, I'd be like, ah, eh, that sounds kind of. Sounds like that might be hit or miss. <laughs> yeah. So, like to summarize, like my point, like both both authors are are witchy alchemists mm-hmm. when it comes to their material. With it, when it comes to their sources, mm-hmm. they are very compelling, very entertaining, very interesting, and very inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I've got a lot of inspiration from both of those authors, although I don't really. Um, do really the same thing you know at all like um i still go back to them i always go back to them i'm always reading them yeah 
<clears throat> yeah, no, that's 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 very true. I, I feel very much the same way. I'm a bit deeper on Borges than Bolaño, um, uh -huh. but I don't feel like any of my writing is really Borgesian, but I'm constantly thinking about him. I'm yes. just always sort of like, is there a way I can make this slightly Borgesian? Like, is there what, mm -hmm. what can I do here to twist it slightly that might make it a, give it a little bit of that something? Um, uh, but I think the, the the artist working now who is most like that is actually David Lynch. Really, oh, like the yeah. more I think about it, there's the Lynch, Lynch seems to me deeply inspired by. I've been watching The Return. I never watched uh, Twilight or Twilight Zone, uh, Twin Peaks: The Return until just oh. started recently, and it's like this oh. is. What this episode is, are you on now? I'm on the second episode. Kevin. Oh, bro. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> are you are you binging it? No, I'm pacing okay. it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So good. Anyway, yeah, Lynch, Lynch is another sorcerer. He's another yes, exactly. sorcerer for sure. And, yeah, that's that's exactly the word I wanted to get to because the thing I've been thinking about is this this tradition of quote unquote magical realism that's been kind of bastardized and sort of watered down and and maybe misunderstood and and taken to some uh fairly banal places in some case yeah. in, in some situations. Yeah. The flip side of that is Borges Bolaño, which is like sorcerer, sorcery realism, right? It's like, sure. it's like magic, you, magic, you can pull a rabbit out of a hat or you can like, you know, make someone insane with the infinity of possibilities or something. Right. And, yeah. and Bolaño and Borges seem to be operating more on that sorcery side. Um, mm -hmm. Not that they're sinister in the intent necessarily, but they're familiar, deeply familiar with the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. And there is like, like I was saying, like a kind of, there's an alchemy to mm -hmm. what they do with their sources, mm -hmm. you know, like it's something that you can't really, you couldn't fake it. You couldn't copy them. Like it wouldn't work. No, no. Right. That's, That's why I don't try to copy them. <laughs> you know, I'm only That's inspired very... by them. I'm just not, I'm, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this a little bit more because Brad and I came of age. I'm not a novelist, not really. Uh, maybe one day, maybe one yeah. day I'll sit down and try to try to mock Brad. When 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 uh, <laughs> when like Bolano Bolano, you realize you need some money. You'll mm. sit down, and right? <laughs> start right. writing novels. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know that like the tension in Art of Darkness is really starting to bubble over. Is like Brad starts writing plays, and I start yes. writing uh, writing novels. That's how you know the relationship is like Frank, <laughs> right. Uh, right? But it, but in any case, we came of age, uh, you know, during a period where everybody was everybody had their uh, their Cormac mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. phase. Yeah, very curious that that was. That was in the in the zeitgeist, but not these two fellows. Really. Not nearly as much. And of Nobody course, they was... weren't. They didn't write in English, right? Yeah. But you know, it could we could just as easily imagine because these translations are magnificent. They're mm -hmm. totally you know acceptable mm -hmm. translations. It's not mm -hmm. like we're obviously it would be preferable to read them both in the original. It mm -hmm. always is, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's not like the translation of twenty six sixty six was phoned in <laughs> right <laughs> like, right, right. Like, yeah 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 all those translators deserve all the credit uh but it's like you we, one could just as easily imagine a scenario where in grad school everybody was trying to write like borges but they don't have the chops to right. do it like yeah. like you know cormac cormac you can fake that style right you can get a yeah. th you can get a thesaurus and start describing nature in this right you know lug lugubrious way yeah and and, and you can kind of almost fake the funk a little. You mm -hmm. can kind of seem to maybe you're never gonna you're never gonna write like Cormac does if you're right. if you're mimicking him. But you can kind of mimic it. you can't fake like a Borgesian story because no. it's just the ideas are too uh, like you just you would you would have to have an original deal uh, idea to even buy, like manage to fake that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I know for me, it, it's never been trying to imitate Borges, but there's been a couple story ideas that I've had that are like, oh, that's kind of a Borges thing. Like, and that then that gets interesting to me for that, but ne never deliberately trying to do it right because it is it does feel like uh, not not uh, it, it's not bla blasphemy. It's just like that's dangerous territory to tread on if you're not going to have something genuinely like philosophically captivating that you're trying to unload on people. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Speaking of Cormac McCarthy, one um, Dustin about your book, Run the Bead. One one um, positive 
kind of comparison that I have, and, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit. And I know you were working on this book for a long time, so it's sort of just an interesting correspondence. Huh. Um, your character, uh, I'm sorry, what's the, the the welder? What's his name again? His name is Ward. Ward, Ward Brown. Yeah. He reminds me uh, quite a bit of uh, Bobby Western from uh, Cormac McCarthy's new The Passenger. I don't know if you've okay. even read that yet. I haven't read it yet. I'm okay. kind of I'm real. I'm saving those two books um, because I like. I'm a big. I love Cormac a lot. Yeah. You know who doesn't? Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big Faulkner guy too. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just been sort of saving those books for a rainy day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, like I've gone, I've read, reread, and reread Cormac. You know, he's a special one. Mm -hmm. It was really, you know, sad to see him go. Of but, course, um, yeah. But yeah, like, so can you tell me why, like, uh, why he reminds you of him? Yeah. So yeah, there's um, Bobby Western in the Passenger. Th there's differences, um, and the one thing about Bobby Western is he's a um, salvage diver. So yeah. it's this, this very, very blue collar, very kind of. Um, uh, in insular world that has its own sort of jog jargon and conventions that people outside of it don't really have access to. Yeah. Um, the, and, and he's kind of got this very um, fairly like even, even keeled there. There's a certain competence he has that's obvious and yeah. much like, much like your character, there's, you can tell that he knows how to do things. Um, yeah. And uh, and then there's just a sort of a subtle, difficult to articulate just vibe about how he moves through the world. Bobby Western is a little bit different because he's um, he's sort of like a mathematical genius who sort of dropped out of that world. So there's okay. this, that kind of difference. But in terms of and I, I wouldn't you haven't even read the book. So it's just really it's just an interesting. Um, I know a little bit about it, though. Yeah. yeah, I know a bit about it. And I love the concept of the salvage diver. I thought when I heard that, I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's. Yeah. Because <laughs> I like see, the thing about Cormac that I really love is that like he he's this really um, interesting balance between like the blue collar and the extreme intellectual. Mm -hmm. Like you get that a lot in Sutri. Yes. And yeah, like, it's like you've got this brilliant guy, but he's like at the bottom rung of society. Was yeah. It, he, yeah. He's a Catholic, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the American Catholic mode. Uh, yeah. Like I, I just, that. I like that. I like that. Um, uh, how would I put it? Like, uh, it's, it's just like a interesting combination um, that I, I think maybe I identify with it a bit, mm -hmm. maybe not entirely like personally, but I understand it. And like mm -hmm. I grew up in a really remote place in the north, in northern Alberta, where you know there. And like my father is a guy that's like you know very blue collar, um, but he's a helicopter pilot. He was a mechanic too, and he's he's really really competent, like you say, really mm -hmm. really smart, um, but not bookish at all. Like he reads Clive Cussler novels if he reads at all, right? You know, like yeah. and so. That type of man, I guess, or individual doesn't have to be a man, but like mm -hmm. to me, that's like a really, that's like something I think maybe university people or even just like, um, uh, like literary people, like don't really all always get exposure to, right? Or might right. not appreciate. Maybe yeah. they do, but yeah. yeah, yeah. It's easy to forget that like those guys built the world in a lot of ways. <laughs> You know, I've I've run into this in sort of the working adjacent to the construction industry, guys who, you know, maybe never read a book. And yet, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's sort of like they can figure out how to fabricate something up in an afternoon that just like I don't even understand how they conceptualized it. You know, no yeah. drawings, no anything. Just like, oh, this thing's got to do this and this. And four yeah. hours later, there's some thing that they yeah. just gave birth to and to them it's no big yeah. deal but yeah it's it, it's really interesting to to tread that ground and, and and remember that that's a mode of living too and not every book has to be about some somebody on a college campus right yeah and then like also like you see like these um 
these tip, these kinds of people, they built the world. Mm -hmm. So there is this, like, they are creative too. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of one thing that I wanted to kind of maybe underscore or like draw attention to with Ward was that mm -hmm. like, he, he builds these huge colossal ships with a crew mm -hmm. of guys. And this is like, you know, a collective creative act, mm -hmm. a practical one. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to just, I don't know. I didn't, I don't, I, I never really like do any analysis in the book about like the connection between making a novel um, and, you know, building some, a massive building, you know, and, or like the, the sort of parallel between, you know, making a novel and like building some large, unwieldy thing mm -hmm. no there are there is a parallel there it's it's metaphorical of course but like right. it it is i think legitimate i i yeah legitimate i mean I'm, I'm i'm biased as a novelist myself but i yeah i 100 oh yeah i mean every yeah. every well-made yeah. novel for whether it's a bukowski novel or 2666 is like a cathedral mm -hmm. yes uh, there's a level of complexity that is profound yeah yeah uh -huh. There's yeah. a lot of heavy lifting involved. Yeah. And and, and like, Bor yeah. Mm. And, and Borges is doing this. Borges has somehow figured out how to write the novel in the short story. And mm. it, it may not be obvious to, to people, but like he's he's basically encapsulating the the cognitive task of a novel into five, seven, ten, twelve pages off. That's way more succinctly you you said what I was trying to say earlier. Mm -hmm. That's a hundred percent what I mean. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, it's profound. It's, it's a, it's a sight to behold in a lot of ways. Um, you had, um, Dustin, we were kind of talking, you know, before the show it, messaging each other and you were interested in talking about the, the narrator, Borges's narrator, particularly yeah. I think in Tlan, but also elsewhere. I mean, what, what is, how do you conceive of the, the narrator of Tlan, for example, or maybe some other, even other Borges stories? What do you, what do you make of that? How he's positioning it? Well, I, okay, so this also, I would just, you know, as a kind of like caveat, mm -hmm. um, mention that this really is a pertinent issue for Bolaño too. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Bolaño always writes mostly in the first person. Right. Right. Mostly, mostly. I think that there is a little bit of third person stuff, but like mainly, mainly, especially as short stories are all in the first person. So you get a narrator, you get a human being narrator. Um, there's a beating heart there. There's a warm body. Mm. And then what do you make of that? Especially with Borges, the mm -hmm. story, what is it? Tlone, Ukbar, Orbis, Tertius, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I nailed it. Nice job. So, <laughs> Nailed what's it. going on yeah. so like the question is like what's going on in this story um and who's telling it um the person who's telling it is i would say you know uh all sort of like a literary alter ego of borges mm -hmm. um but right away you know he starts to notice that there's this fictional intrusion in the real world um the narrator positions himself in the real in a in a, the literary milieu of Buenos Aires. Um, he's with his friend Adolfo Boy Cazares, who's also a great writer. His book, The Invention of Morel, is a favorite favorite of mine. Mm. And so he's he positions he positions himself in the real in a real world that is slowly being intruded upon by fiction. Mm -hmm. And what I find glorious about this is how he, how he, his exposition. Mm -hmm. So who could it be? Who could, who's, who's better or who could be more ideal for a, uh, an exposition of this, this plot? Only Borges. Right, right, right. Only Borges. And like I was saying in our DMs, like um, even the preamble, I love I love how he's kind of old fashioned in the story too. You know, like how he gives you a preamble. He doesn't kind of just jump right into it. Mm -hmm. uh, like with this, this work team creating, mm -hmm. you know, a fictional world, you know, like he doesn't just jump right into it. 
it's this labyrinthine kind of um, description, this mm-hmm. subtle, articulate, skin, scintillating description of kind of this intrusion of the fictional world onto onto the real world or into the real world. And to me, that's like a great summary of Borges. Even his, like whether you're talking about his his fiction, his poetry, or his nonfiction, there's this alchemy of the imagined and the lived always 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 mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and um i i really like appreciate that so he, the narrator is important the narrator the narrator is crucial because that's the that's the that's the mind that's receptive to this what this this thing that mm-hmm. you see it's kind of a magical realism but that term or that label gets a bad rap it's like alchemy it's like yeah. literary sorcery yeah yeah and like you can and like <clears throat> when i another thing i was seeing in the dms that's interesting to me is like so you know one of his favorite images or symbols is a labyrinth mm-hmm. and when you read like especially the preamble in the tone story you read this labyrinthine preamble but then when you start to talk about it, like I was talking in the DM, when you start to pick it apart and like analyze it, you yourself feel like you're in a labyrinth. Yes. Yeah. So he has this integrity, like um in in his um there's this integrity in his composition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's 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 a couple things or uh, thinking back on that story that are that are tie into this that I think are quite profound. One is, uh, just from a writer's standpoint, the techniques to make such a story, it's believable. Like, yeah. as you're reading it, you, it really does feel like, at least at first, that he's just describing something that actually happened. Um, yeah. And that it's that it's not, it doesn't, it's somehow perfectly crafted, but is, it doesn't feel like you're being handed a completed story that has been generated for your amusement. This feels yeah. like, okay, he's telling me something that actually happened. And then the other thing that got me thinking about this, and this is really interesting, there's magical realism, the, 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 the genre, which is, which is often telling you stories that include magical, magical elements. And yeah. then what I think we're kind of talking about, and, and maybe this was already said, and I'm just repeating it because now I get it, is that Borges' work itself is an act of magic. Sure. Rather than being a story where magic happens, if that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. That's a great way really, of putting it. Yeah. And then, like, and to just to add to, and like, if I go on, if like I'm a little bit of a ram, I kind of. I, no, you're great. I'm a bit you're of a doing talker, great. But like, um, <laughs> so if I go on too long, just cut me off. But like, no, you're one doing great. Thing that I just wanted to add to what you said and what I mentioned also in the DM is that like, um, what you're getting is kind of like this very plausible voice that's describing something that's absolutely implausible Mm -hmm. so that you get a kind of, there is this like always this kind of tension. That's a tension. It's a really original Mm -hmm. fictional tension that he creates. Yeah. It's not easy to do. I think that another guy that really does it well is Sebald um, or Mm Zebald or WG Sebald. Yeah, I've read. I've only read Austerlitz, but you're right. There is something very familiar in that. Very, there is some correspondence between these two for sure. It and makes he me. Bring, he brings up. He he actually uses like um, Sloan, Akbar, or Orbis Tertius in as a subtext in Rings of Saturn. Oh, okay. so it's really worth reading that book. The now, Rings book has just climbed up my TBR pile for sure. Well, it's 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 relevant <laughs> if you're interested in because like Borges says in that um he did you ever watch that interview he did with um Buckley? Yes. It's called Firing Line. Mm-hmm, so good. And he talks about like uh how Kafka how like later authors help you to reread and understand earlier authors and he uses the example of Kafka be, um, Kafka's work sort of retroactively um, shining a kind of like a new light or something on Hawthorne 
Mm. And I think the same thing is kind of true of Sibald and Borges. Interesting. Okay. Sibald has his own gesture completely. Yeah. Yeah. But gonna... it helps you to kind of he he reads Borges in a certain way. And like mm-hmm. if you're really familiar with Sibald's writing, then it's kind of a nice it's just interesting. It's that it's that retroactive light. Yeah. You know? And they certainly I, I do recall from reading Austerlitz that there is a similar that same kind of erudite style, like the sentence to sentence level that feels mm-hmm. very um very scholarly but without necessarily being uh there that saying something sounds scholar has a scholarly style makes it sound like it could be stuffy or something it's not that it's a it's a yeah kevin the uh, the place that my mind keeps going back to in this discussion about borges and we'll make time for bologna too yeah we got uh, more bologna is here. it reminds me of uh brecht where uh you know the thing that brecht is most famous for aside from the three penny opera um is the verfremsdung effect or the 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 v effect or the alienation effect it's really quite simple it's that he, his theater was always showing you that it's an active theater mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we take this for granted now he right. was born they were born it looks like within a year of each other mm-hmm. uh, uh brecht and borges um and so just a similar period where it's like okay we're done playing this game where we're trying to uh, pretend like this story is happening in a vacuum or this play is happening you, you, we're we're trying to like my point here is that Borges is sort of always showing you that he's weaving a story yes yeah. isn't he yeah and so but then he takes it into this sort of another right. level very similar to Brecht yeah, yeah but I but I think I think Bolaño I think Bolaño without making the overly you know Bartolome postmodern move is also constantly he's never pretending it's not a book that you're reading or a story that you're reading right and he's making all the use of the medium that he can this is one thing i think that they also borges and bolaño both have in common is um a lot of every book has we we are constantly talking now even when like mccarthy comes up or whatever the internet discourse is constantly about like adapting it into a film it's always about like, well, who would be who would be the director to make the movie? How would you know who would stars the whatever? But both Borges and Bologna were making work that I don't really think it is adaptable. Most of it um, in a productive yeah. way. I don't really want to see any Borges short stories as a as a film, and I don't really want to see twenty six sixty six as a film. I don't think it would be all that good, frankly. Um, no. I, I mean, it could be obviously. It depends on what you did with it. It's a huge book, it, so it depends it, yeah. on where two, you slice two, it. Two six 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 was already kind of spiritually adapted, and it's called True Detective. Like well, that's, <laughs> that, that's what yeah, you, True True Detective was the reservoir for a bunch of unadaptable stuff. Uh, well, and that's <laughs> and that's how right, and that's how it should yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's how it should be. Create original things that are deeply inspired by by great things. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. That's the move. Yeah. Well, no. even like, even um, Hitchcock would say, I think he said famously that, um, you know, it, b- books aren't necessarily books aren't films. Right. Right. Uh, that it, it's just yeah. Although they are highly um, um, connected, they're very mm-hmm. connected. They're, the the cinema and the novel are very. They're like the cinema is kind of like the like the uh it's sort of like a spawn of the novel it, like <laughs> sure. it, but it's not the same it's yeah. not it the is same. it's cinema cinema is like the novel uh sure. hooked up with wagnerian opera mm. and sure. and uh vaudeville theater yeah sure yeah 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 and like yeah. and then what can you like you know I'm really into Murnane too, Gerald Murnane, the Australian writer. Um, yeah. and he kind of talks dismissively about, um, well, third person narration for one, he thinks it's incompetent. And then he also kind of like nicknames it film fiction. Oh, really? Yeah. And he okay. says that, you know, like if there's not a narrative voice, he considers the work incompetent, which is, you know, I do, I do a third person. I've done two novels in the, in the third person yeah past tense and i love Mer- i love Murnane, but now now he What's might that? now i don't know i love Murnane, but now i don't know i might have beef 
because uh, yeah. <laughs> just... well, me, one of the things that is like really, um, I mean, one of my favorite authors, um, you might have read him. He's a little newer. Uh, Eugene Martin. I don't know Eugene Martin. No, no, he's an American author. He wrote Firework. He wrote um, like uh, what's the the newest one's called Pure Life. Okay, I'm writing uh, this down wrote, because I'm getting the feeling, Dustin, that you and I have very, very similar tastes. So I'm yeah. This well, down. like <laughs> this dude, this dude Eugene Martin is, I think, the best. Like, I don't really, I don't really fuck with a lot of contemporary fiction, and that's no like, that's no real like diss mm-hmm. to anyone else out there doing it, like me. Mm-hmm. But like this guy, yeah, I do fuck with okay. hard. Right. And um, he's the he's one of the greatest novelists ever, in my opinion. Wow. wow. Yeah, like um, I recommend In the Blind. Um, he wrote a book called he's got five novels and his novel Layman's Report is about the fellow who who Errol Morris did the documentary about who, you know, perfected the electric chair. And then he kind of collaborated oh. with this like that. uh that a Holocaust denier. Yeah. 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 I'm... So th- he's got a book, a sizable novel called Lehman's report about that guy. Wow. It's like interesting. A... Oh, fuck. Wait, are you, are you telling us? Are you, are you, are you my French? Uh, yeah. No, you're no, all right. No, no, well, no, you are, right. you are Canadian. So you yeah. do, uh, you have, you have the yeah, French, have even French. though you're in Alberta. Um, <laughs> yeah. Eugene, so, this, sounds, just, this sounds good. Get, this I sounds get, right I get, my like, picky. I get picky about like um, voice and narration and stuff. It's like, mm, it's yeah. highly, yeah. it's like one of the most interesting things to me about fiction. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. Just, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. it it's it's just that's where all the meat is. That's where all the juice is to me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm this I'm this I'm absolutely the same way. And I mean, this is one of the things that's intoxicating about Bolaño to talk a little bit more about Bolaño. It, yeah. It's very different voice than Borges. There I mean, they're they're covering a, there's a Venn diagram, I suppose, but there is a um it's funny cuz all the adjectives I try to reach for to describe Bolaño's voice, I think could sound like I'm not saying something good. Like there's something often loose, though it's though it seems like it's intentionally made to feel loose. There's a there's a there's an expansiveness to it, right? It does feel a Bolaño paragraph feels like it can go anywhere. And for me, yeah. if I'm reading a bit, that's part of like the tension is that like is this world that he's describing going to explode on me at any second? And and I don't know how he accomplishes it feeling that way, but every time if we're going to talk a little bit in the after dark, patreon.com slash our dark pod, we're going to talk about um, Bolaño's story, the insufferable gaucho and how it's yeah. basically a remix of Borges short story, the South um, okay. interesting little correspondence, but we'll talk about that for the, for Patreon folks. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but what do you, uh, what are some, you for so the big ones for Bolaño two six 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 savage detectives. Where are some other places you were talking about that other short story about the the book of uh, French poetry? What are yeah. some other places where you find some some heat and light from Bolaño? Some other works that you really enjoy? Well, okay, like you mentioned some like kind of the bigger ones, mm-hmm. but I'm a I'm more of like I love all of his stuff. Mm-hmm. Really, I'm a big fan. Um, but like my favorites of his are the shorter novels. So By Night in Chile, Amulet, Distant Star. Um, there's one called Monsieur Pan. They're all, all bangers. They're yeah, there's like, bangers. there's the, the, yeah, the, he has like five or six short novels that are awesome. Mm. Like he just, they just crystallize everything about him. That's great. And like his ideas are so cool, you know, like uh, the one of, the, the by night in Chile uh, concept is stellar. It's stellar. It's like this priest who's like involved with um, uh, what is it? Egg. Uh, there's like some sort of like controversial like uh, Catholic group. Was it, cannot... it Op- Opus Dei? Yeah, Opus Dei, mm-hmm. and he kind of like gets he sort of gets like roped into the to um, the new regime in Chile, and they he, they they get him to teach them about communism. And then he ends up going to Europe and 
he's like doing falconry or working with falconry. These falcons that are like killing the pigeons that are shitting on the churches. <laughs> the churches yeah. and stuff. Beautiful. Like, that scene is so beautiful. Such a wonderful metaphor. We read that. I think we, the, is that what we mm-hmm. read? We read that on the core. Episode, yeah. We may have read that I during the, the uh, yeah. episode we did with astral, but yeah, okay. that yeah. that's a very famous scene. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a superb perfect. book. It's a yeah. superb mm-hmm. book. One of the best novels I've ever read. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's I just get perfect. Get like, yeah, um, I, I am much more of a, Bolaño uh, stand that I am a Borges stand. I feel yeah. Borges, this is Borges feels like a the, chore for me. The, uh, I but Kevin, I think the yin yang of us is that I'm a little more bo- in bo- the Borges side, and you're a little more in the Bolaño side. But it is yin yang. I think we got a little dot sure. of the other in each side. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, and I like getting, and that's okay. And I like getting a little bit narrowing the Bolaño um, oove a little bit. So because I do want to read more, but it's big. And you can. Uh, this you is. The, I think people get a little daunted by Bolaño because they they see twenty six sixty six and they go, oh, this is like a. I don't have three months. I don't right. have six months. Right. As our as our friend Dustin here says, read some of these short novels. Yeah. You could read them in if you read like I do. You can read them in a couple days, two or three days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair yeah. to say, Dustin. Oh yeah, they're. They're um, nothing. They're like as far as time commitment goes, they're nothing serious. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like I would say, just like I know that like there's been some less. Some they found a lot of his. They found like in his papers, like either novels he was working on or like just the ones that he didn't like as much and didn't push when he was alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some of those ones, I, I guess, aren't as good. But mm-hmm. like, um, I mean, like everything that came out on New Directions, mm-hmm. uh, like kind of near the beginning when he was sort of first taking off, there all of that stuff is great. So like, like Nazi, one, Nazi like literature this, in the Americas? Like this is kind of like this book. Yeah, Nazi literature it, in the Americas. There we are. Yeah. Like this book is kind of like a short story collection, but it's like, I like it because and it's a good one to mention because it like has this Borgesian sort of like, uh, um, like um, what's the word? Like interconnected um, literary universe happening in it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's sort of like meta textual. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And like, it's got like a, a, like a fictional scholarly apparatus at the end with all of like the writer's bodies of work and stuff. That. Like it's that. just completely, <laughs> It's total. It's a total work of art. You know? Right, like, right. Yeah. This is a slightly tangential, but I think it was Ben Thomas a few weeks ago on the Bird website, friend of the friend of the pod, um, yeah. who said he basically came up with an idea for a book, but it's just a collection of its translator's notes, forward, maybe yeah. some footnotes, afterward, right. <laughs> index. It's all of that, but not the text it's, itself. There's no extra. That is and actually pretty awesome. Yeah. It's a yeah. really good idea. And, that and that sounds to... like a satire, kind of like a, yeah. a, a, sure, a I mean, wild one, maybe. It could be yeah. very, very funny, and you could have different authors get involved. That mm-hmm. would be, in, in in another life, that is yeah. a project that I would definitely want Yeah, list of on. list of illustrations. And yeah, you just keep going. It's everything right. a book could have except the actual book. Except the that actual is, text that itself. Is, that is yeah, pretty cool. That's yeah. a very, yeah, it's a little on the nose, but kind of amusing. <laughs> well, that would like kind of... That would sort of like, um, uh, you know how like David Foster Wallace talks about, you know, like fracturing the text, you mm-hmm. know, with the footnotes and 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 whatnot, right? Like that would mm-hmm. be the that would be as that would be taking that idea of fracturing the text to its logical completion, you know, right? As <laughs> fractured right. as it could be, yeah, blow yeah. it up like completely. Literally, does it exist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's, there's, there's some virtue to that. Well, that, that, that's, and, and this is what's cool. You know, we're talking to you, Dustin. Here, you've got a great new book out. Um, we're talking about Bolaño, who, whose work is feels it's, it's more than contemporary, and there is this notion. I think people can kind of get start thinking oh you know there's really there's always this notion of like the novel is dead or that that literature sort of over and maybe i'm imagining that as like my imagined enemy in my head but but we read these sort of things and you kind of you know you talk about nazi literature in the americas and it's like this thing 
there's so much more that can be done and will be done. Um, yes. And talking to you, you know, you got this book out. It keeps me excited. The fact that this is this ground is always fertile to be tilled again. There's always yeah, more well, to do, always more to say. Yeah, that's what you know. That's some. I really am a big fan of Mikhail Bakhtin. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys read him? Have you ever read him? I, I've read a little bit of his of his work. Yeah, it's been a while now, but yeah. Well, like in the dialogic imagine dialogical imagination, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Like, um, he talks about the novel being an open form. Mm -hmm. So the no that's why I'm attracted to it as a form mm -hmm. is um because and yeah because it's it's always open as Bakhtin says mm -hmm. no matter what's happening in the world or what could happen it's the the novel can take it all yes like yeah. there's nothing that, like you talk about like oh could this could this novel be adapted to the cinema yeah. or could this novel or could this story um, to me, that's like, <clears throat> besides the point, although it's an yeah. interesting, kind of interesting, it's sort of besides the point, because why, why do you need to improve on this perfect form? Right. You know that like perfect in the sense that it's literally infinite. Yes. And then you go back to Borges and Bolaño and they prove it. Right. They right. Prove right. It's infinite. Like with right. this idea of the, like with Boy Cazares at the beginning of Tlone, they're talking about the copulating mirror. You know, the, the idea of a, the, a mirror and a mise en a bim, you know, mm -hmm. like um, this infinite, this infinite, like, series of copies of variations of like, of reflections that are inverted and like, it becomes like, it's literally infinite. Yes. And in capable hands like Borges, you know, it becomes, becomes like a, just outstanding you yeah. know there's nothing can do anything really quite like it <clears throat> you can do anything yeah well let's pick yeah. this idea apart just a little bit that beautifully sure. said if yes. we didn't have uh, five or ten more minutes of the podcast to make i'd say we could close there yeah very well very well yeah. said uh yeah, and i co-sign that what do people mean when they say that the novel is dead i think one they mean i'm too lazy to write one yeah. uh and i yeah. uh and or i think too i too lazy to read one yeah, yeah too lazy <laughs> to read one yeah um or just too distracted yeah. Um, uh, I think that they mean that like as a popular medium and of course, uh, fine, it, it's never going to be, we're, we're never going to go back to the 17th century where it was right. somewhat salacious for a lady to pick up a novel. Right. You know, we're never going, right. we're never going right. back. Fine. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. but, uh, I also think they mean, um, I think that we're having a crisis right now. This is going to get a little high minded, but we're talking about Borges. So, yeah. okay. And Bolaño. I think that people are having a crisis because humanism is just vanished. Mm. And I think we talk a lot about transhumanism now, right? But that would imply right. like, what, what about where did humanism go? Was it all a dream? Right. Like I, I, uh, this is a separate podcast entirely, but I really think the novel was the, the, um, for a good long time, the container of uh, like the sort of bourgeois, kind of lie of mm -hmm. hum secular humanism mm -hmm. like okay maybe we don't maybe god is dead but gosh darn it we have to be good to each other right and that the floor fell out from that when consensus reality went away right. um in popular culture and now i think people are struggling with like well what the what the hell good then is a novel ah, like, what, yeah there's not there's nothing for the novel to reinforce to make us feel okay about the com compounding interest from, from right the grand steel plant, right? Know, but, but, but we but we vote for the right person. So right. You know, do you right. understand what I'm saying? So I, this I do. Is very uh, sort of high minded, but I think. But your point already speaks to you know the other side of what I'm saying here now, Dustin. It's like, well, then, fuck it. The novel can do whatever we want. It can do whatever we need. Yeah. And yes, maybe it means we only sell five thousand copies. But the but the five thousand people who read that novel, right? Yeah, it, that can go on and change the world in a really yeah. direct way. And maybe and 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 our next uh, Bolano, he's out mm -hmm. there working right now. Yeah, maybe he's in the room with us now. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah it's the, right. you know, I mean, who knows? So yeah. yeah, I I I mean, the way that I tend to think about it is like the the sort of getting into my metaphorical space about this is like the novel was never intended to stop the bomb or something like that. <laughs> what it was intended to do 
is right. it provides you a little hole in the ground that you can hide from the fallout. Like it's yes. not, it doesn't save the world. It saves you for a minute. That's the way I, I that's the way that I think about it. Somebody yeah. on Twitter was <laughs> asking, ask, I don't said something like, I don't understand the Tolkien thing. Mm. And I wanted to I but I was too tired. It was my birthday yesterday. I was, yeah. I, I, I was yeah, so birthday, I'm by tired. The way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. that was my son's birthday too. We have, we share a birthday. Beautiful. That's very, that's boring. a very, that's a very novel, very Borgesian thing. kind it of, is, yeah, yeah. It, it really happened. Yeah. Uh, Bor has to get the token thing either. <laughs> is yeah. that right? Okay. But, but, yeah. No, he didn't the, really care for him. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. Well, the most obvious, and everybody knows this, and this is not this is not to throw any shade at Tolkien. Tol- the, the very obvious thing about Tolkien is that the 20th century required a popular escape into fantasy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The most obvious thing in the world. And he knew what he was doing. And there's no uh, shame in that. There's no shame in that. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Where it gets well, maybe some shame is if you start lying to yourself about mm-hmm. what, you know, about what reality is or something. But to escape. Sure. Is not. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. People not after to do that forever. N- not after uh, circa 1910 to 1945, 46. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. there the world needed a little bit of a. The world needed some elves. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Some good old fashioned sword uh, fights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's an interesting point, you know, about escape. I escape, or you know whether you're writing a book or whether you're reading a book, you kind of have your back to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but like we're talking, if you're talking about labyrinths and Borges and stuff like that, you're, you know, and you mention this time between 1910 and 1945 or, or, or so where the world was kind of on fire, literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you to look at Tolkien, which, you know, is these are stories about conflict too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. so you end up like in the labyrinth in the cathedrals you end up going you you end up at the same place always but you might just be going the roundabout way the long way right you know, like um yeah. and maybe that's you know perhaps like you know not perhaps i think that human beings can handle the truth but some human beings can't look at it directly yeah like well, and then and Herzog says, Werner Herzog, the great Werner Herzog, who I love too, mm-hmm. um, says a yeah. poet must never avert his eyes. Mm. And like when I was writing my this book, I took a big risk because it's a COVID story in a way. Like it's all implicit, and it's not. I don't look at. I don't like. I don't like uh, rhapsodize about COVID mm-hmm. in the book. Yeah. But yet it's implied, it's implicit in the story. It's con- it's a con- contextual detail. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I, by the way, I thought that was a bold choice because I, when I started reading, I was like, oh, yeah. there's COVID going on. And to me, it's like, mm-hmm. this is a choice well, we all have to make as writers right now. Is COVID in your book or is it not? My, I, I'm going to be writing, yeah. and I, I, I want to get back to Dustin's novel, yeah. but I'm yeah. my next, my next project, personal project is going to yeah. be, uh, a one woman show I'm writing for a very good friend of mine uh, yeah. that is going to be a, a kind of a Bologna esque murder mystery about, and maybe it's, I don't know. I'll, let me, let me give you the pitch. So it's going to be a murder mystery <laughs> about a, uh, an actress so, somewhere in Minnesota, similar to this certain neighborhood over here who uh, is doing a one woman show during COVID and she comes out, in the first scene and she has everybody social distance and she, everybody has to wear a mask and she's going to be talking about her one woman show called next door about how we all have to look out for one another. Uh, we're all neighbors and it's just a tough time. Okay. And then uh, she goes into the second character of her one woman show and it is a, uh, a detective who is a computer forensics ex- expert who is involved in, uh, a murder case that's a couple years old and and she can't she can't let it go uh because an actress in some neighborhood in Minnesota was murdered during during covid 
and it's revealed that, that the actress was one of these uber snitches who was snitching oh, yeah. on every neighbor and mm-hmm. and every yeah. and so we and then we the one woman show goes through all of the characters that are sort of sus- suspect in the murder that's very uh huh. that's structurally kind of a, yeah. yeah so there you go whatever um, yeah. But yeah, that's interesting that you're. Yeah, we need more. We well, I, need more material. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, like I, I knew I was taking a risk by doing that, but I couldn't help myself. Honestly, mm-hmm. you know, I couldn't. I honestly couldn't, um, because there was so many weird little things that I'm sure people have forgotten that you could mm-hmm. use. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like um, and like I say, it's implied in the story, but it's not something that you know is dealt with. Um, frontally right we could sit you could say it it really just, was yeah it was the it was the water we were swimming in for the better part of two years yeah which is yeah. one of the one of the one of the one of the ways i feel like it's been easy for them to make everybody forget because right. it was just so total mm-hmm. yeah. well we shouldn't this, forget that no we no we shouldn't like, you know my first novel was kind of used historical context too so i studied history i have a history degree so i'm sensitive to context so i think context is great because context Mm -hmm. provides so much raw material Mm -hmm. you know we're talking about borges and 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 bolaño and their sources and what they do with them Mm -hmm. well context if you're sensitive to it is a great source yeah absolutely a lot of neat things with it and there's there is also a way that storytelling provides is a better carrier of memory than just your memory right we can all sort of be like i I think this is kind of what happened but then if you get a work of art a film a play a novel that really captured it not necessarily in every factual detail but in the sense of how it was that seems to keep the memory alive better than anything else right um and and so you know run the bead one of these works from the COVID era that is going to help us remember what it was that I think would be easy to go down the memory hole otherwise. Sure. Like on one level, like, I mean, definitely. And I think you, you, you phrase that well, you know, like um, that's perhaps like, I mean, you can read history books and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I like that too. I read lots. I tend to read history and I like it, but Mm -hmm something there's something lacking in the aesthetics of historiography you right. know like they just don't they just right. don't do it all or they can't do it doesn't do the same thing right it doesn't do the same thing as like a novel or a poem or a film yeah that, that you know, gets like, to what it fe- that's what gets to what it felt like which is yeah it's huge and you don't it's hard to get that out of reading history texts as good as they can be it's hard to get the sense of what it actually felt like to be in that time brad what are we talking about on the after dark for yeah, patreon well, we're patreon.com slash our dark pod we are going to continue talking with great dustin cole we're going to talk about um bolaño's story the insufferable gaucho um and how it plays off of um the borges story in very deliberate and not hidden ways plays off of the short story by Borges uh the south we may also we'll see how kind of time runs but we might also talk a little bit about Borges's short story the garden of forking paths which I've got a couple interesting things hopefully I think they're interesting anyway to say and I know Dustin's got some uh Dustin has read that recently too and, and probably has likely has some insights so follow us come back if you're a Patreon supporter you get access to the After Darks 20 to 30 minutes for every episode. You also get access to the Bookends Reading Club. We are reading uh, right now Confessions of a Mask by Mishima. Um, and uh, you can come hang out with us and talk about that book or get access to the uh, the audio recording afterwards. Plus, you get some other goodies if you're a Patreon supporter, including quarterly postmortems. We're doing one of those here in the next few days, Kevin. Yeah. Yes. I am reading Confessions of a Mask right now. Ah, it is... I did not know what I was getting into. I am very interested in it. And uh, we, you're going to want to yeah. join that book club. You've, you've got to consider Patreon. If you're listening to this and you've listened to numerous core episodes, you know we're doing something nobody else is doing. Mm-hmm. The way that this is sustainable is through direct material support. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. We make it worth your while. We're going to come back and talk with Dustin for another 20 or 30 minutes. I, Dustin, this has been a very enjoyable conversation so far. I've really enjoyed it. Give your plugs one more time before we... Uh, we pause and then come back on the after dark. Um, 
so just about the book, new book and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Where can yeah, people find you? Where can I people guess, find you and all thing. that? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter, messing around on there. Um, yep. Don't expect it to. Don't expect my Twitter feed to be like a commercial for my writing. If I use it for that, but I post a lot of images and just shit post a lot. You're but, good. Um, you're a good follow. <laughs> I yeah, likewise. Good follow. And I, yeah. I'm gonna follow you too, Kevin. Yeah. We, we don't oh yeah, I gotta make that happen. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So I'm on Twitter, Dustin Cole. Um, my my um little like clickable handle or whatever is like looks like a bot it's just dust and see with some numbers behind it okay but we'll have that in the show notes yeah i always put links to the twitter in the show notes so go there yeah yeah and then my new book run the bead is Mm -hmm. out on soyos books it's available for pre-order um it's gonna be shipping on september 4th Mm -hmm. And um, if you're interested in naturalistic contemporary fiction, which is like kind of like not really in the vein of much else, I think <laughs> these days, mm-hmm. like it's something I think different, um, really different, I, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. From what's going on right now um, in that in indie lit or yes. alt lit, um, yeah. it's something for you. Especially if you don't mind a longer book, it's like over 400 pages. So yeah, Ooh. and I, 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 I highly recommend for me. I'm strongly recommending. It, it gets the Brad <laughs> Kelly recommend. We're yeah, gonna come you, back. Brad. Yeah, absolutely. Oh uh, yeah, no, then thank you for coming on the pod. We're gonna then, come yeah, back. Yeah, Kevin, I, I just wanted mm. to say sorry to interrupt you. Um, but yeah, likewise, this has been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We and we're it. just getting we're just getting started. We're gonna come yeah. back for the after dark one last time. Patreon.com slash art of dark pod. We'll take a quick break, come back. You can get the after dark episode on the Patreon. I'm gonna go, even though it is the Lord's Day, and I am mm. in the Lord's time zone, US Central. Alberta's Alberta's mountain time, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll give you guys some of the U.S. central energy. I am going to go <laughs> in the five minute break that we have. I am going to go try and do a secular humanism downstairs. Oh, I don't yeah. know what that means. I don't <laughs> me neither. Report back. Wish me luck. <laughs> All right.